Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, this week's parasha is the third parasha of the book of Bamidbar, also called Numbers, and it's called Becha Lacha, which means when you set up. Um, so I've got a message this week for 2009-10 um, parasha reading uh, of Becha Lacha. It's called um, Rising Up. Anyway, um, let's start. I'd like to start off the um, parasha real quick, talking about the word uh, that makes up the title for the parasha, Becha Lacha. It comes from the root word Allah, which means um, went up or rise up or go up. Um, in this parasha, it's actually used uh, as the word went in the phrase in verse 2, where it says, when you light. Um, the lamps. Uh, this isn't a common use for this word. It is used 161 times as went up, um, which is a lot more common uh, than to light. But um, let's take a look at this word real quick. It's the uh, it's the Hebrew word uh, in your Strong's Concordance 5927. Uh, uh, Allah. And in the ancient Hebrew uh, pictographs, which each have their individual meanings, it could mean uh, it's it's spelled in in regular Hebrew as Ein Lamed He, which in the ancient Hebrew could mean see, teach, reveal, or see the teaching revealed. And uh, I'm going to tie that into the ending of this here when we get to that point. Uh, the important thing to look at the first thing that we see in this parasha is. Uh, it talking about uh, speak unto Aharon and saying to him when you light the lamps the seven lamps shall give light unto before the menorah um, and that's just got an interesting set of uh, things that it's digging into in the remez which are spiritual definitions it's um, similitudes in the scriptures where things like uh, Mashiach who teaches that parable of the wheat and the tares, he'll say the wheat is the children of God, the tares are the children of the devil. He's giving some definitions, spiritual definitions of the physical things. So you read the story, but each one of those items has an alternate uh, definition. And when you plug those all in, you get an additional text there, a spiritual text. So I'm going to apply that principle, um, which I call remez. Um, into this verse two, and what we, what we see is we look at the dynamics of what what's happening here. What's the pattern of what's happening? What's the mechanics? Aharon, which is the high priest, he is going to light or set up uh, the lamps. The seven lamps shall then give light over before the menorah. Uh, and in the Hebrew, uh, it's mul panim. Uh, panim means face, and so one could interpret this to say that the, the when you light the lamps or you set them up, they shall uh, give light before the face of the menorah or in front of the menorah, which makes sense. Now, the mechanics of what's happening here is you have the high priest who's going to set up or, or light to lift up the lamps. Now, in Proverbs 6.23, we're going to plug in a few definitions that, that go underneath that text. It says, the commandment is the lamp. So we're going to think of the lamps as commandments. And uh, and then we know that in Proverbs 6.23 it says the law is light. Um, it also says that the law is truth. And uh, so we get this concept of light being both the law and the truth. Um, and then we have the panin, which in Hebrew means face. And in face, um, the spiritual understanding uh, of face can be judgment. And uh, just like we see people's expressions on their face, anger, um, joy, all these kind of different things. And uh, it's also where information comes in and things go out. Um, so then we see the menorah. And when we look in Revelations, it talks about the seven menorahs. And the menorahs, they are defined as, the, they represent the seven churches or ecclesia or congregations. So... If we take a look and plug those things back in here, we may see an additional understanding, um, which is we have the high priest, who in this case could model Mashiach, and it says when he lifts up the commandments, then um, the commandments will give uh, 
truth or light or law um, to the judgment of the congregation. And that's how a person could interpret this verse too in the Lamez. And so what's interesting about that is, does that fall in line with what the scriptures say about Mashiach? It says Mashiach in a prophecy, um, I believe, I think it's in Isaiah, but I can't remember right offhand, but it talks about, no, 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 it's in Psalms, I think. And it says that it's talking about the Mashiach and it's saying that he will come and magnify the law and make it honorable. And there's a couple things about that. Um, but the question is, does that fit this pattern that the Mashiach will will uh, lift up the commandments, which is essentially, um, if we look at our time, the Messianic movement, it's a movement about lifting up the commandments. It's about saying that these aren't something old that should be done away with or that are no good, but we're elevating them, lifting them up. And, um, and what that's going to do is then change the face or the judgment uh, bring truth to the judgment of the church. And I think that is what's happening, so I can see a lot of things in there. That's just to touch on verse 2, and the reason why I even brought that up, it was it's kind of a more advanced teaching there, and I had to summarize it real fast. But the reason is it, it'll make sense when we get through what this parasha is about and what's happening. It'll make it all make sense. It'll wrap it up. So next, so the first thing is we have this little blurb in this parasha about Aharon, lighting the lamps of the menorah, and the menorah would shine before the menorah. Um, then we get to the next elements that happened, which is the Leviim are cleansed, and then it talks about the Leviim replacing the firstborn. And then it talks about Pesach, and gives the commands and the ordinances for Pesach. So my first question is in this little grouping of three, what do you think they have in common? The Leviim being cleansed, replacing the firstborn, and the Pesach. Um, one of the things that I try and do is look at the patterns and the mechanics of what's happening because you can see what's happening in general and apply it to those same general principles that happen in other places of the Torah and you can start to make some connections. So the Levine being cleansed is to go from a state, a lower state of uncleanliness to a higher state of cleanliness. And the same thing happens when it's talking about replacing the firstborn. You take in the firstborn and you have the, uh, the Levine and they're going to replace the firstborn. So you have a switching. This one is going to be brought down, and this one's going to be brought up to replace it. Um, similar to being unclean, and brought to the status of being clean. And then you see that in Pesach, what happened was um, the scriptures say that, uh, talk about Egypt as being Yorewahe's firstborn. And what we see is Israel, right? He says in Isaiah that he gave Egypt as a ransom for Israel, and he gave men uh, for them, their lives for them. So you see this concept that this one, who was the firstborn, was sacrificed to replace them with the other. And so you see this pattern between the Leviim and between Israel and Mitzrayim. And so that's what I think connects all these. Now, how he chose those people, how did he make that separation of who was going to be killed in the Pesach uh, situation and who was going to live life and death? Well, in the parable of Mashiach, where he says there's two fathers, children of the devil and the children of Elohim, you have life and death. Just like Moshe said, I set before you life and death, good and evil, choose life. So Yorewahe, his children represent life and the devil's children represent death. So what we have here is how do we decide between the two? Well, it was about obedience. He gave them a command. It is about two things. It's about obedience and fear. And it says fear is the beginning of wisdom. Well, if you apply, he gave a command. Put the blood, take the Passover lamb, kill the blood, put the blood on the doorpost. When the angel of death, sent by Yorewahe, sees the blood, which has really seen the obedience to his command, which was to put the blood on the doorpost, he could have said anything. He could have said, put a purple scarf out there. It didn't matter what was said um, in the sense that it, as far as what is the mechanic of it, the mechanic of it is obedience. And when you mark your household, it was an interesting thing because you were marking yourself that Paro could have come through and said, okay, we're going to go into everyone who puts this blood on the doorpost and we're going to kill everybody inside. That was a legitimate fear. So you had a fear of Paro when you identify yourself. And you had fear of Yorewahe, which was going to come 